The United Nations Security Council's ceasefire re resolution is pro-Hamas, and America is complicit. That is what we will argue on today's episode of New Ideal Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. My name is Ben Baer. I'm a fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute. With me is my colleague, Ilan Jurno, senior fellow at ARI. Ilan, let's dive right into this. Uh, first, just uh, some context for our viewers, especially people who may have joined us more recently. Uh, what position has the Ayn Rand Institute taken on uh, the, the war between Israel and Hamas? And maybe that will set us up then for talking about this uh, latest development. We've taken the position that this is a clear night and day moral difference between two adversaries. Hamas initiated this war, which is the latest round in an ongoing fight that it has been waging against Israel. Hamas exists to destroy Israel. That is its chartered mission. And we saw that happen with the brutal attack of October 7th. That was just a manifestation of what Hamas is really about. It's not an aberration. It is consistent with its mission. By contrast with that, Israel is a basically free society. It's a bastion of civilization. Hamas is a dictatorial regime. It's an authoritarian Islamist regime. It tries to create a totalitarian society. And as I said, it, it, it exists to destroy Israel. That is a perverse goal. And if your version of a just society is one that is built on the ruins of a free society, there's something fundamentally corrupt about your vision, which is what is Hamas, uh, that, that is what it, it, it's pushing and has been pushing for decades. So Israel, in my analysis, is not a, an occupier. It, it left the Gaza Strip in 2005 unilaterally, and it has a right to its self-defense. It is a moral right to its self-defense. And our analysis on this issue is highly distinctive. We've been arguing, we've been arguing this for a long time, that in war, the right to self-defense or the moral right to self-defense cannot be compromised. And that includes in the face of civilian deaths. And one has to understand where the culpability for those deaths and other injuries stand. And that is with the side that is the initiator of aggression. In this case, it's Hamas. And Hamas is completely responsible for all the deaths on both sides of this conflict. Now, it's important to say that there's a lot to say about the way Israel has conducted this war. And Israel... Uh, sees itself as living up to international norms about distinguishing between civilians and combatants. We've talked about that in other episodes. We can talk about it briefly here. The idea that war can only be waged in that way and that it have to be surgical and highly precise. I think there's a certain pretense about that. That's not the reality of what war really is. And I think the, the important thing to understand is that whoever is truly innocent in Gaza and I think there are people like that. I think they're they're afraid of their own leaders. Their suffering is entirely the, the, the brought upon them by Hamas, not Israel. Even though Israel is the stronger party, it is militarily more powerful, and yet it is the victim in this conflict. And Hamas is the aggressor, even though it's weaker and uh, on the side of uh, destruction. So Ben, let's talk a bit about the details of this resolution, because I think that's the key story here. Why don't you walk us through what is in the UN resolution that is so shameful? Yeah, well, it's worth giving just a little bit of context first so that the resolution we're talking about is one that passed yesterday, but it wasn't the first uh, resolution on this topic. There have, there have been negotiations in New York about uh, what to say about this situation in Gaza over the last few weeks. Uh, just uh, earlier, about, about a week ago, March 22nd, there was an attempt to pass a, another resolution. This one was supported by the U.S., but it was vetoed uh, by Russia and China because it didn't explicitly call for a ceasefire. That's, that is the goal of Russia and China. The fact that Russia and China are in a position to veto such resolutions uh, is a pretty significant fact we're going to come back to. And while there are many things we're going to say uh, critical of the whole apparatus of the U.N., it's worth saying it, at least that this one didn't call for that. Um, and that's part of the reason why the U.S. was supporting it. Obviously, though, that wasn't able to be passed. Uh, and the new resolution, the one that passed just yesterday, uh, does call for that ceasefire. It demands that unspecified, all the unspecified all parties, doesn't name any names, follow 
the so-called principles of international law, uh, and especially the provisions that uh, reject all attacks against civilians, uh, something we'll also come back to, expresses, quote, deep concern about the catastrophic human situation in the Gaza Strip, uh, pushing, therefore, for more humanitarian aid to that category. And as a result of all of this, it calls for a, quote, immediate ceasefire for the month of Ramadan, respected by all parties, leading to a lasting sustainable ceasefire and the unconditional release of hostages. Now, Ilan, there's a lot, there's a lot to say about this. Um, uh, one thing I would highlight to begin with is just how evasive the language uh, of this statement actually is, how, how it is uh, pretending uh, at, at various facts that it has really no basis uh, to pretend to. So uh, there's throughout this kind of phony neutrality. Uh, you see that insofar as it equivocates between uh, the, the attacks of Hamas on October 7th, which as you rightly emphasize were attacks by a basically authoritarian regime, unprovoked attacks on citizens of a free nation, uh, and the so-called attacks by Israel on Gaza uh, aimed at toppling that authoritarian regime. That's, that's the language of saying that all parties must uh, respect civilians. But there's obviously a big difference between uh, deaths in war uh, that result from either of those kind of quote-unquote attacks. Big difference as to where they come from. And this, the, the phony kind of neutral language in this resolution is just papering over that. Uh, it's also just pretending that uh, this humanitarian aid that it wants is somehow going to help the situation uh, and not actually end up supporting, strengthening Hamas. Uh, it's a well-known fact that Hamas and its, rival and its, its various gangs steal most of this, use it for their own purposes, uh, and otherwise it, it ends up empowering the, the society of Gaza, which is the society that, that Israel is at war with. It also has the really phony pretense that uh, this ceasefire will somehow be conducive to the peace of a long-lasting sustainable ceasefire, as though Hamas won't just use it to regroup and rearm and fight again another day uh, like it and its other uh, Palestinian terrorist organization cohorts has always done. That's the, the kind of pretense and the evasion of it. But there's also just real moral obscenity in what it fails to do. Uh, while it expressly uh, expresses concern for Gazans who are dying because of Israel's war, it offers no actual explicit concern for the Israelis who've been attacked by Gazans, uh, by Hamas for years. And the UN has never done that, as far as I know. Is that is that your understanding, Elon? Yeah, I think th there's a lot here that's outrageous, including what you've said. And I, I would add that it, anyone who really cared about human beings and human life would have been outraged when Hamas took power and held power by force for the last 16 plus years. If you want to talk about humanitarian suffering and disasters, that is a man-made disaster entirely of Hamas's doing, and nothing has been said about them. That no real opposition has, has ever arisen at the UN, no condemnations of Hamas's regime, independent of what it's done since October 7th. And that it's what it's done since October 7th and October 7th itself fully warrants the most severe condemnation, but that's exactly what you would not get from the United Nations for reason we'll talk about. I want to just underline something you said here, Ben, which is the silence of the UN on Israeli victims. So there, we know 1,200 or so Israelis were killed on October 7th itself. And that means at least 1,000 families, and it's a small country. That is a significant impact. That is a, a population that has been terrorized and continually terrorized by rocket attacks over the last 15 plus years. And then on October 7th, made to feel, and I think understandably made to feel, completely vulnerable. Despite having this powerful military, Hamas managed to shake Israel's 
uh, security and make them feel vulnerable because they were vulnerable. They were attacked by uh, people breaking through fences and, and coming in with uh, power gliders. So the, none of that has been condemned. And it, it's important to recognize there are Israelis who had to leave their homes in the south of Israel and there are people who were displaced. You don't hear about them. And why is that? Is there, is there now a, a scale at which certain kinds of suffering does matter and other suffering does not? And I think there's something really perverse about the way the UN approaches these issues. I think it's, it's reflective of a kind of moral bankruptcy. Yeah, I, I, I did a little digging and I actually I found that it's not just that this most recent resolution doesn't condemn uh, the October 7th attacks. You'd think that if uh, the UN were concerned with peace and freedom, uh, that it would have done that at least before before offering the kind of resolution we saw this week. But no, it's never done that. Uh, and as far as I can find, it's never condemned Hamas for being the kind of uh, authoritarian regime that it is. There was an attempt, uh, from what I found, to offer such a resolution back in 2018. It was it was vetoed. Um, and so when it's when this latest resolution is talking about the rights of all parties and and uh, the respect uh, for peace and freedom on all sides, how it needs to be respected, uh, it's it's completely phony. And when we know what the result of this will be. If, if Israel were to follow it, and if it were to actually cease fire and let Hamas regroup, we know the result would be not a pro-Israel effect, but a pro-Hamas effect. And that's why this amount, even though it's pretending at a kind of equality and neutrality, it's, it's, it's really siding with Hamas over Israel. So Ben, some people listening to this or, or reading about the issue might think, well, the, the, this looks like a double standard. How, how do you react to that? It's easy to see how it would look like that. If you, if you take the guiding principles the UN avows and give them the most charitable reading and uh, think that they're serious about them in the first place in that most charitable of readings. But if you look at the way the UN has always operated, and the way that it's always understood its own guiding principles, it's always protected aggressors uh, under the kind of pretense of the equality of nations. And if you want a potent symbol of this fact, it's, it's the fact that the UN Security Council, which is supposed to be uh, the you know, central, most authoritative body in that organization, concerned with matters of war and peace, has uh, regular members and it has permanent members. The five permanent members are the United States, Great Britain and France, and Russia and China. And Russia and China, historic, particularly uh, at the height of the Cold War, were brutal communist regimes. Uh, to this day, they remain authoritarian regimes where there's no respect for individual rights, rule of law, uh, or any of the other kinds of uh, values of a free society that you'd need uh, for a country to want to respect the peace. Uh, we know Russia in particular uh, lately has been concerned with invading its neighbors. And so these are the people who are given to us as authorities to have the power to veto resolutions concerning matters of war and peace. Uh, it's it's not just a an act of hypocrisy or a double standard if it's an official policy of the organization to include such members as their most authoritative uh, votes. Uh, and the way that Ayn Rand once explained this point was it amounts to a town's having gangsters as part of its crime fighting committee on the so-called principle that all of these nations are equal. Uh, well, if you treat good and evil as equal, that conveys uh, basically complete lack of respect for the notions of good and evil. It, and, and it eradicates the difference between the two of them. And whenever you do that, you, you hold up the evil as, as, as equally worthy respect of the good. Um, one last little anecdote that I'll add here just to illustrate how deep this this really morally corrupt view goes at the UN. Uh, if anyone's been paying attention to the news just recently, there's this UN agency, UNWRA, which is a kind of relief agency that's attached to 
you know, for the sake of Palestinian refugees uh, in in Gaza in particular. And it's it's become a, a well confirmed at this point, I think, scandal that this the UN relief agency in Gaza is staffed by members of Hamas, not just people who happen to be, you know, vote for Hamas or have family members in it, but some uh, of their staff actually participated in the October 7th attacks and uh, are are known to have helped hold Israeli hostages uh, in Gaza subsequent to that attack. So and that's not just a few bad apples. That's a culture of toleration for evil that goes to the heart, really, of what this organization is all about. I, I just want to amplify your the point you're making, Ben, and, and, and reinforce it. To be morally neutral is to aid and abet evil. And the UN is predicated on moral neutrality. Membership is open to everybody. It's a, we've, you've already mentioned that Russia and China, in both their original communist form and then the authoritarian forms today, they were invited into the Security Council, the most powerful organ of this uh, institution. Other member countries include a host of authoritarian dictatorial and theocratic regimes. And the fact that they're part of the UN should, should alert people to, to the, the undiscriminating nature of this organization. So a lot of people celebrate this feature of the UN because it's, a, it's an open door policy, but it's precisely this neutrality that is, reveals the corruption of this organization because it puts on par, puts on, on the same level. And we saw that in the wording of the resolution that you read out earlier between Israel and Hamas, it, it treats them as equal. And when you do that, when you when you say, ah, I'm just going to put them, I'm not going to try to distinguish good and evil, we're going to uh, put them on a level playing field, that kind of moral neutrality can only benefit those who are seeking to do harm, those who are on the side of evil. And this is inherent in the UN. It goes back, it, it precedes this conflict, it's broader than this conflict. You go back to the history of the UN, you see it all over the place. And there's a profound point that Ayn Rand makes about the nature of evil and the way in which it benefits from moral neutrality. So in her analysis, and this is just a snapshot, there's much more to say about her view of evil. Her view of evil is that it is essentially impotent. It doesn't have its own ability to create or do positive things. So it's parasitic on the good in many, many ways. And it's in, in particular, it's parasitic on the good because it's constantly trying to pass itself off as better than it is. And so this is one way in which the UN is, a, it's a colossal crime against humanity, if you ask me, that's what the UN is, because it enables all these regimes like Hamas, like Syria, like Iran, like North Korea, all the member states that are in effect dictatorial, theocratic, authoritarian, that destroy the lives of their own people. All those regimes, by virtue of being in the UN, get a certain kind of credibility. And then on top of that, they're, they're given positions of power within the UN. For example, Saudi Arabia and Iran have had positions on committees for the rights of women, if you can imagine that. But that's true. That actually happens at the UN. It's a feature, not a bug of the system. The UN from top to bottom enables dictatorial and theocratic regimes. It's, it is a tool for them to gain the moral cover that they need to pass off their crimes and launder their reputation. And we, we see that here in the resolution uh, in the Hamas-Israel conflict, because what does it do to say, we call upon the release of all hostages. Well, we know that Hamas invaded Israel and kidnapped Israelis and take them, took them hostage to the dungeons and the tunnels that they have in Gaza. Israel didn't do that. Israel took people who were soldiers of Hamas in effect and took them, took them, you can say they took them hostage, but they're in effect prisoners of war. That is the very different thing. But what happens when you treat them all as hostages is that you whitewash the actual hostage taking. And I think that's a small example of the way in which the, the UN is, through its moral neutrality, lends legitimacy to evil and whitewashes it. And this can only embolden Hamas, particularly the resolution. And it, it is a, a, a global means of, uh, for dictatorships to make themselves look good. And it's no accident, therefore, that Russia, 
and China in particular have been the ones pushing on this because they know what the UN offers them. They, they love being part of the UN. And this is one way in which they pay forward to their friends who cover for them when the time comes for it. And just one final thought on this. I've mentioned that Ayn Rand has a deep analysis of evil that informs my view of the UN. And, and, and I think you can hear it in her own analysis of the UN. One of the things she said about moral neutrality really rings in my ears every time I think of the UN. And this is what she said. This is a direct quote. To abstain from condemning a torturer is to become an accessory to the torture and murder of his victims. Close quote. And I think of that not only as illustrating the culpability of everyone who is part of the UN, but in particular one nation, and it's our nation, it's the United States. And I think they, the United States has a, a special responsibility, special um, moral failing, precisely because it continues to be part of the UN. So I, wanna, I think we should talk a bit about America's role, both in this resolution, Ben, and also in, its, in the UN generally. Why don't you give us your perspective on that? Yeah, I, actually, it occurred to me one thing that's good to say first is that it's worth pointing out that this this particular analysis of the UN uh, of embodying this uh, destructive moral neutrality view is in many ways different from the usual criticisms that you usually hear of the UN. The, the idea isn't here that uh, there's some kind of one world conspiracy that the, the UN is uh, duplicitous uh, about uh, some kind of uh, uh, hidden goals it's trying to achieve. The idea of that there's something respectable about moral neutrality is something that goes to the heart of the kind of moral agnosticism that is expressed all over our culture. It, it comes from the idea of judge not lest thee be judged. It's just this, it's this contempt for the importance of moral certainty and contempt for the need to draw clear lines between black and white that is all over our culture. So this isn't some hidden agenda. This is, this is uh, they, they've made their, their purposes and their agenda clear, and it's been fueled by basic ideas in our culture, which, which, need, to be, uh, which need to be rejected. And, and this is the reason why, what we see happening at the UN is the reason why. And um, I think it's the same ideas that lead the US to the stance that it's taken uh, on this particular resolution. So the, the US did not vote for this resolution, but they also did not vote against it. They could have vetoed it there on the Security Council and could have done that. So they abstained. Uh, and the State Department issued a statement uh, really, uh, giving their reasons for abstaining. Uh, they say the resolution doesn't make the ceasefire contingent on the release of hostages and it doesn't condemn Hamas's October 7th attack, which surely is true, and those surely are problems um, with the resolution. But notice that the, the, the form in which this criticism is registered is not to actually veto the resolution, which they could have done, and it's not to uh, wash our hands of the whole United Nations Security Council if it's the kind of organization that could adopt such a monstrous uh, statement. It's rather to try to sit on the fence. It's to, again, engage in this kind of pretend neutrality. Well, we're neither voting for it, nor we're nor voting against it. And th the result of all this, again, is a silent, tacit concession to empowering Hamas. And, and that's evidence that there you can't be neutral on these kinds of issues. You can't, people pretend like they can be morally agnostic. They can pretend like they can sit on the fence, but especially if you're in a position of power like the United States is, your silence will be taken as a implicit sanction of, of the thing you are failing to condemn. I just want to add one thing to that, Ben, which is that anyone who takes a moment to look into the history of the UN will see that it littered absolutely littered with scandals. And these are a subject of scholarly analysis that a lot of, there's a huge literature on what would it take to reform the UN? What would we do to avoid another scandal like the one in Iraq, the one in Bosnia? There's just so many scandals in the UN. But I think that is a superficial understanding of the problem. The problem isn't only that the UN has gone wrong on some concrete 
program or some concrete agreement and so forth. And, and it, but it, though it has, and it's important to see that, what's missing is an understanding that the UN's credibility is kept afloat precisely because it includes better regimes, precisely because it includes the United States and the United Kingdom and France on the Security Council and many other freer countries in the General Assembly. Their presence, you might say, brings up the average, but it's, it's worse than that. Their virtue is what makes the UN even semi-credible in anyone's eyes. And it's precisely because of that, that America is part of this, lending it credibility, giving it its sanction, that the UN has any standing in anyone's eyes. Because if it were just the, the, the core dictatorships and theocracies and just all these horrible regimes that destroy human rights and that are wa wage war like Russia and like Hamas, if that's what you had at the UN, nobody would take it seriously. So it's, it's the crucial factor is that free countries, and especially the United States, are party to this. That is a huge part of their complicity in the crimes of the UN. They are accessories to empowering Hamas. They're accessories to empowering Iran and North Korea and their crimes against their own people. So America's responsibility isn't only, is not restricted to this ridiculous legalistic analysis of, oh, they didn't include this one phrase that we wanted in the resolution. They didn't include uh, uh, condemning Hamas. Yes, of course you should condemn Hamas, but if that's what you're arguing over, you're missing the point. You belong to a club you should not belong to, and your membership in it makes it, it whitewashes it. So I often tell people when they ask me about the UN, my view of it is it's like a gangster bar or a dive bar that you happened into. And you walk in for a moment, and you realize, I don't want to be here. There's, it looks like everyone's about to go into a brawl. There are murderers and criminals every direction you walk into. But your presence raises its moral standing because you're an upright citizen and you make it seem like a better place than it actually is. And that is a huge, huge moral failing of the United States for continuing to be part of this organization precisely because of its, its vice of moral neutrality. And to, to me, the conduct of the U.S. with respect to this resolution is one more example of that. Yeah, and I, I thought it would be good to share with our audience some uh, an actual quotation from Ayn Rand, which I think really brings out the in full force the point that you were just making, not only about the nature of the U.N., but about the way in which uh, free Western nations have empowered it. So this is taken from an essay of hers called The Anatomy of Compromise, uh, which the title should, uh, should convey to you something about what she's, what she's discussing here, uh, you know, as opposed to the anatomy of a murder. Psychologically, the UN has contributed a great deal to the gray swamp of demoralization, of cynicism, bitterness, hopelessness, fear, and nameless guilt, which is swallowing the Western world. But the communist world has gained a moral sanction, a stamp of civilized respectability from the Western world. It has gained the West's assistance in deceiving its victims. It has gained the status and prestige of an equal partner, thus establishing the notion that the difference between human rights and mass slaughter is merely a difference of political opinion. That's from 1964. She's, of course, talking about the communist world. We don't have as much of a communist world today. We do still very much have an authoritarian universe that is ruled by Russia and China. And uh, they are getting all of the same kinds of assistance, status, and prestige from the West's cooperation in the UN as the communists did in their day. Uh, and it's as though we haven't learned an important lesson. So Ben, some of the commentary around this is interesting and worth commenting on. I, I want to hear your thoughts about both Biden's position in general and the administration's going along with this or not going along with this. But I want to contrast it with what people are responding to from Donald Trump. So the, the presumptive nominee for the Republican Party has come out and he said things that make him sound pro-Israel. What's your take on this? Yeah, so what's interesting about this is if, if, you, if you believe the... Uh, I guess, con conventional mainstream commenters on this issue. You, you, you'll be led to believe that the uh, the left, the Democrats, are the uh, 
uh, the ones that are at least reluctant to support Israel, probably secretly against Israel on the side of the Palestinians, whereas the right, uh, Trump, the Republicans, they're the pro-Israel side. And what's interesting is to look at what Trump recently said about not just not just the October 7th attacks against Israel, but against uh, this particular resolution that just passed yesterday. And it's been offered uh, it's been offered up to the public as a, as a version of a kind of pro-Israel stance. Uh, this is this is Trump being you know strong in favor of Israel uh, as opposed to the weak Biden uh, policy. But I'll read a passage from what he says here, and it's, it's it's worth listening to the actual language and the the tone of it and the the style of it. Here's the way Trump describes what Israel should do. Quote: "You got to get it done, and I'm sure you will do that. And we got to get to peace. We can't have this going on." And I will say Israel has to be very careful because you're losing a lot of a lot of the world. You're losing a lot of support. You have to finish up. You have to get the job done. And notably missing here is any kind of moral language, any kind of uh, sensitivity to the fact that there's a difference between good and evil, uh, that uh, it's not just you have to get it done, but that you're morally righteous in doing it. Uh, it makes it sound like it's something you're you're trying to sneak around and get away with, uh, especially because you fear the disapproval of the rest of the world. The emphasis you're losing a lot of the rest of the world. And there was, I think, even more of this passage you wanted to to comment on, Elon, right? Yeah, I, I think he's been quoted in a way that's oddly more favorable to him if you take the position that Israel's in the right. So he's made to sound like he's encouraging them to continue and take the, the war to, to its necessary conclusion, which is, in my view, the defeat of Hamas. But I don't think that maybe that's his view. But the way his the rest of his quote goes, it makes you wonder, because what isn't often quoted on this from his statement is he's reacting to seeing bombs being dropped in Gaza. And then he goes on to say, quote, oh, that's a terrible portrait. It's a very bad picture for the world, end quote. And I think what that suggests to me is a concern with the opinion of the rest of the world with respect to how Israel is conducting the war. And you might have a question about what the opinion of the rest of the world is, but the question should be, does it matter? And what is right and what is wrong? What does your independent judgment tell you should be done regardless of what the rest of the world tells you. And if the UN is any kind of barometer of the rest of the world, the rest of the world is morally bankrupt because many people in the UN are on the side of Hamas. And we've seen that. And the Security Council vote on this resolution is further evidence of that. So to me, it's, it's symptomatic of a non-moral or amoral perspective. And I think that you can hear all kinds of things in what Trump says, and you can hear it in a way that's very supportive. And it should be said that when he was in power, he did a number of concrete things that were supportive and pro-Israel. But it's a, I worry if he is in power because there's no telling what his position would actually be in this kind of conflict, precisely because there's such an emphasis on you're losing a lot of support. The rest of the world looks at you and they don't like it. Okay, if that's how you're deciding what to do, you're not deciding based on principles. I mean, it's worth pointing out that the Biden administration has has done things that concretely help Israel as well. But as we are really starting to see, they're doing it against what appears to be their better judgment. They're doing it contrary to their stated moral principles. Uh, and it's that's finally coming to bear on a resolution like this. And so what I think that brings out is that Biden and Trump are not all that different on this issue. The only difference is in the difference uh, in language, in effect, in, in difference in PR, Trump's kind of characteristically amoral attitude, where there's where he sees no moral dimension to this conflict, where he only sees strength and weakness, popularity and unpopularity, I think really is the essence of the Biden position. It's just stripped of the phony moral language. And if if you really understand that this this, this stance of moral neutrality, both with regard to this UN resolution and by endorsing the UN as such, which is dedicated to moral neutrality, then you can wrap that in all the kind of moral language that you want to. 
but it still amounts to contempt for moral judgment and the necessity of morality. It's just pretending not to be. Uh, Trump doesn't pretend to care about morality. And so they really amount to the same thing. There's a way in which Trump is more honest about it, but that just brings out how uh, awful and evil uh, the, the stance actually is. Um, Ilan, I wanted to I wanted to start to wrap up uh, because you've uh, you've written a lot on this subject. You wrote a book on the subject. You know a lot more about it than I do. Uh, I want to get a sense of your read on what's around the corner, especially now that this resolution has been passed. Do you think Israel will comply with it? Uh, do you think if they do comply with it, that what are the odds that a ceasefire will actually ho hold? Um, let us know your thinking on this. I think it's useful to remember that there was a ceasefire in place on October 6th, right before Hamas broke the ceasefire and, and launched its attack. So ceasefires are not a magic solution to conflict, and it requires both sides to the left of them. So I, I think there's a certain level of fantasy about what the ceasefire will do. And as you said earlier in the conversation, a ceasefire in this context necessarily helps Hamas. Hamas is on the back foot there, clearly lost a lot of people. There's no question in my mind that a ceasefire is detrimental to Israel and, and to the U.S. as well, insofar as Hamas is our uh, hostile force. I don't think Israel is going to comply with this resolution. I think they have shown that they're, they're similarly conflicted, I think, on, on the morality of this war. And it's they have in the past been more clear about the need to retaliate. But unfortunately, I think the Israeli policy is often confused and lacking in moral clarity. And I think th there have been things that surprise me in the positive about how they've conducted the war. But my greatest concern, Ben, is that the declared goal of defeating Hamas, of, of eliminating this threat, is not the goal that they'll actually accomplish. I think they'll fall short of it the way they have in past rounds of this fighting and we've talked about it in other podcasts and if that happens then we know how this movie ends there's a there's a rerun of hamas rearming itself and coming out back with another kind of attack and new forms of atrocity so it, it really is essential that there be a defeat of hamas but and i and this is a point that is hard for people to process the defeat of hamas is not accomplished merely by depriving them of weapons and, and, and bullets and, and ammunition. That is a necessary condition. The other condition, or one other condition that's necessary is the intellectual, ideological deprogramming of the Palestinian population and orienting them away from destructive ideas that celebrate so-called martyrdom and murder and slaughter. And deprogramming them from their support for Hamas and the other Islamist groups who are just waiting to become the next Hamas in power and orienting them instead to positive rational values, the kind of inheritance that we have from the Enlightenment, where the individual's life matters and you don't send your children in to be human shields or human bombs. That is a fundamental shift that has to happen. It takes a lot of work to do that kind of deprogramming. But to me, it's a necessary feature of what defeating Hamas entails. And I, that's the part where I think I don't think Israel knows how to do that very well. It's been done in past conflicts, and we know that it's achievable, but it really is critical. And that's where I think more of the conversation should go. Thanks, Ilan. We'll have to see what happens. Um... I think I'd like to wrap up. And uh, before doing that, I would like to share with our audience, especially if this, uh, if our position on this issue is new to them, uh, some resources they can take a look at to get a uh, uh, more context on this issue. So first, uh, we have an article on the major subject of today's podcast, the United Nations and uh, the, the uh, contempt for morality that's embodied in its kind of neutral stance on major questions of war and peace. Uh, one of our uh, fellows, Augustina Vergara Sid, wrote an excellent article summarizing Ayn Rand's criticism of the United Nations. It's called Ayn Rand's Radical View of the United Nations. Uh, it mentions that quotation that I read earlier in the program, along with a number of other sources you can take a look at for getting a better view of Ayn Rand's position on this subject. Uh, 
I also wrote a short article that uh, deals with the moral principles at the heart of the current conflict, or rather the, the principles you need to understand to properly evaluate this conflict. Uh, this is an article called We Ignore the Unconditional Right to Self-Defense at Our Peril. Um, both of these are uh, published in our, the Journal of the Ayn Rand Institute, New Ideal. You can find Augustina's at bit.ly, Ayn Rand Radical View of UN. Mine's at bit.ly slash right to defense. And last but certainly not least, I will mention a book by... Uh, my colleague Elon Giorno. Uh, this is a statement of ARI's position on the Israel-Palestine conflict, what justice demands, America and the, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This is a, a, a systematic, thoroughgoing analysis of the philosophical issues at the heart uh, of this question. And one thing I think you'll find if you read this book, which I highly recommend, is just how distinctive ARI's position on this topic is. It isn't a left-wing, it isn't a right-wing analysis of uh, the Israel controversy. It's, a, it's the, what it looks like to take a rational philosophy and to show how to identify the, uh, the virtuous uh, party to this dispute, the one that deserves justice, uh, not because of history or ethnicity or religion, uh, but because of rational philosophical principles. So um, also, uh, just to wrap up, mention that if you have questions you would like us to answer in the future about objectivist philosophy, we are spinning off a special Q&A podcast, uh, which we'll hopefully begin to release soon. Um, we welcome your questions, your philosophical questions about the philosophy of objectivism. Please send those to experts at einrand.org. If you enjoyed this episode today uh, and you want to follow us, Please, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. Click that bell button to get notifications when we go live and post new recordings. If you're watching a recording, uh, please like it, comment on it, share it with your friends. Same thing if that's uh, if you're watching us on Facebook. And if you have any other questions about what came up today or suggestions for future episodes, uh, please send us an email at newideal at einrand.org. So thanks very much for joining me uh, kind of at the last minute on this one, because this just happened yesterday, Elon, but I think it's important to get uh, ARI's distinctive analysis on this topic out there as often as we can.